Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Ben, and in this episode of the Smoking Hot Confessions Barbecue Podcast, we're talking to a man who loves to barbecue squirrels. Yep, squirrels. Hey family, I hope you're well wherever you are and you got that thin blue smoke rolling. Today is a really interesting episode of the Smoking Hot Confessions Barbecue Podcast. We're talking to a fellow called Joe Wilson. Now he's based out of Arkansas in the United States and he's the CEO and the founder of Steaks for Sheepdogs and the world champion Squirrel Cook-Off. He's a self-described fire master, meat sculptor, preacher of meat gospel and the number one enemy of the vegan. So I think this is going to be a cracker of an episode. But before we get into it, I've got a couple of announcements that I do need to run by you first. First up, Christmas is just around the corner. So if you're looking for some uh, some top quality merch, we've got some hoodies, we've got t-shirts, we've got caps, we've got beanies, we've got some, uh, some beautiful tumbler mugs there that are going to keep your cold drinks cold and your hot drinks hot. Head on over to the website smokinghotconfessions.com and check that out. Now, while you are there, if you're just at the beginning of your journey, check out our free ebook we have available for you there. It's the Beginner's Guide to Real Barbecue. And inside that, you're going to find everything you need to know to go from zero to hero in the world of low and slow barbecue. No more burnt sausages, no more burnt steaks, just some delicious, soft, juicy, smoky meats. And a big thank you this morning to everyone who's jumped online in the Smoking Hot Confessions barbecue community on Facebook. It's great to see you here this morning. We're going to have a lot of fun talking to Joe in just a minute. Now, if you're not there and you would like to be a part of these live podcast recordings, do jump on into that group. It's also just a great place. It's a great family-friendly corner of the internet where we just hang out and talk about barbecue. So come along and join us there. Now, if you're not joining us live, if you're catching the replay later on, if you're on uh, YouTube, make sure you give us a thumbs up or subscribe and hit that little notification bell. If you're on Facebook, it's all about the likes, the comments and the shares. Over on IGTV, we love those cute little love hearts that they have and uh, give us a comment and a follow as well. And if you are listening in on a podcasting app, do rate and review the show. Five stars helps us get out there and helps us spread our, our barbecue message. Now, I think that's probably about all the spruiking that you need out of me. It's time to get Joe in here. This is the internationally awarded Smoking Hot Confessions Barbecue Podcast with your host, Ben Arnott. How long's it been since your last confession? Joe, welcome, my friend. Welcome to the confessional. How are you today? Man, I'm on top. I'm ready. I'm ready to, to hit the hard questions. Oh, excellent, excellent. Okay. Well, I've got plenty of them lined up for you today. Now, where are you recording from today? You've got a really interesting looking uh, sort of window background there behind you. Yeah, man, I'm in uh, Sam's home office here in Bentonville, Arkansas. So Sam's Club, you know, like Costco, I'm I'm sitting in their office building talking to a beautiful specimen of a man named Ben all the way in Austin. Oh, you stop it. <laughs> Fantastic. So, mate, what was the last thing that you barbecued? Man, I I, uh, I worked on some Kansas City strips just last night, but uh, on Saturday, I went ahead and I started the process of making a uh, beef shank uh, pastrami. And so I took the whole leg from below the knee to the hoof and have started, you know, I trimmed it off and and I've got it soaking in the fridge right now. And, you know, my goal is, is come next Saturday to cook this thing low and slow and kind of make like a caveman club of pastrami out of this deal. Mate, that sounds fantastic. Do you have like a, like a pre-mixed brine that you like to use with it or are you coming up with your own thing? No, it's just a, it's just a brine that I came up with and, and uh, I've been successful in the past. You know, that's what I like to do. I like to tinker around with flavors and, and, and come up with cool stuff. And, you know, currently I'm with one of your previous guests, Mark Lambert, and we have a Wilsonshire sauce that that we worked on together. And, uh, boy, it's killing it here in the States. I don't know if you guys have any of it yet down there, but up here it's it's a, it's a brand-new condiment that everybody's chasing. Mate, that sounds uh, f- fantastic. I do think I remember Mark mentioning that when I was talking to him there a few weeks ago. That's um, that's a really interesting sounding sauce there. Bit of a take on the uh, Worcestershire sauce. 
Yeah, I tried to make one easier to say. And, uh, you know, <laughs> I was one day and they had the top 10 words that Americans had a hard time to say. And one of them was that word, which you just said, Worcestershire sauce. <laughs> and uh, so I thought it'd be a lot easier if I just went ahead and called it Wilson Shire sauce. And I started a fermentation, took me about three months. And uh, once I got it done, I bottled up about 20 bottles of it and sent it across the country to people I thought would appreciate it. Mark was one of them. He took it out that weekend and, and got a solid walk at a steak cook-off. And, and he called me the next day and he says, I need more of it. I told him he, was, he wasn't going to get it because it took, you know, 90 days to make. And, and uh, last year, we went ahead and, and started producing it. It's a commercial product. Man, we sold out of the first two batches. And when I say batches, you know, I'm saying 500 gallons at a time. And, and uh, so it's, it's been a successful product, man. Mark Lambert's a great guy to mentor off of. And, and you know, a lot, of, a lot of people probably don't know, but Lambert's stuff is in so many stores in the U.S. I mean, you could go to big retailers, small retailers. And if Lambert's name on there, people are buying it. So uh, it was nice to get my picture on the bottle and, and my name on it. So, Yeah, it would be very gratifying indeed. I think actually, if I cast my mind back to when uh, Low and Slow kicked off here in Australia, when I was first getting into it, I was having to make all my own rubs. And I think that, uh, that Mark's Sweet Swine of Mine was actually one of the first rubs that was imported. It was one of the first ones that appeared in the stores around sort of 2015, 2016. I'd I'm uh, I'm I'm pretty sure I've got that right in my head, but uh, could be, could be. I'm pretty sure <laughs> he does a lot of stuff. Yes, he does. He's and and you know not only that, man. You know I always look at at these barbecue superstars and and stuff as as legends of the sport. But you know I kind of think, hey, if I was really into NASCAR, how how many times would I get to meet the driver? Not very often, right? And barbecue is one of those things to where you could walk up to the best in the business, strike up conversation, and more than likely become friends with them. And that's the cool thing about about what we do. And, um, you know, I mean, not to name drop, but, hell, we, we know a lot of these people. And we invite them to our house. We cook with them. We break bread together. And then, you know, you build a friendship. Yeah, exactly. It's a very unique uh, com- competitive scene there. Now, when you mentioned uh, Kansas City Strips before, is that Strip Steak? Yeah, so that's, uh, you know, the Kansas City Strip is the same thing as a New York Strip here in the U.S. So, yeah, it's it's a Strip Steak. It's a, it's the tail end of the, of the ribeye, right? Right, interesting. Is there, is there a particularly different way that they do it to make it a Kansas City Strip and not a New York Strip? No, it's it's the same deal. I mean, it's got a shorter tail on it. Other than that, it's it's the same steak. Now, if we were closer to New York, I'm sure we'd call it a New York strip, but uh, we'll go ahead and call it a Kansas City strip right here in the middle of the country. <laughs> All right, fair enough. I can't I can't argue with that. So, mate, how did you get into barbecue? You're uh, you, you're from Arkansas. Is it something that you grew up with, or something you came to later in life? Uh, my dad was always cooking with fire, and when I was 14 years old, I got my first catering gig. Um, I cooked chicken for a tire shop, and, uh, you know, I set up my grill. I had a pretty big rotisserie. It would do about 100 pounds of chicken at a time. And, and so a tire shop had asked if I'd come down and cook. I did this uh, this lunch, and just so happens right next to me said a, a Playboy Playmate she was signing autographs and uh here i was 14 with the playmate sitting next to me i was going to get free wheels and tires put on my truck when i turned 15 and so i thought it was probably the best thing to get involved with i mean pretty girls good meat (laughs) free tires and wheels can't go wrong with that deal so uh i've been i've been cooking for the public since i was 14 years old so you know i've I'm 48 now, so I've got several years of experience in it. Yeah, that's a pretty incredible story. That's pretty much every teenage boy's dream, I think. You know what? It, I I think most teenage boys can get to that level just by putting a little effort into it and 
not being scared and getting out there and then working hard and you can make money off a of barbecue. Yeah. Yeah. Very nice. And so from there then, how did you get into competition barbecue? Oh man. You know, I think most redneck people like myself, whether it's our dog or truck or whatever we have, it's always going to be the best, you know, at least in our eyes. So you got to kind of put, put the meat on the fire and prove it to other people. So, you know, I, I started doing a lot of chili cook-offs in, in my younger days. Um, really enjoyed cooking chili, red and green chili, and, and uh, was successful at winning those things and then got involved with the State Cook-Off Association uh, right at the conception of it. I was there at the, at the beginning and uh, loved talking with Ken and Brett, you know, and and watching that thing grow and then being around KCBS style barbecue and, and, uh, smaller competitions, loved it. Uh, the people were great. So I've been around it for a long time, man. And, uh, I tell you what, it's the people that make it. Anybody could eat meat, but it's the people involved in the barbecue and, and, you know, for the past five years, being the MC of the state cook off association world championship, I get to get up on stage and, and talk to the best steak cookers in the world. And uh, that's where I've been blessed to, to meet some of the Australians and the folks from New Zealand and, and things like that. They're good guys. Uh, you know, I think you guys are like Texans with a British accent or something. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I, I think that there's a lot of uh, Australians that might uh, n- not appreciate uh, being told that we have a British accent, but uh, we'll, we'll let that one slide today. Uh, so. <laughs> Uh, the, the SCA World Championship cook-offs have grown exponentially. And what are some of the changes that, that you've noticed as, uh, as MC of the events over the last five years? Well, man, whenever it first got to Billy Bob's in, in Fort Worth, you know, I think we had 100 teams. And we thought that that was the pinnacle. Um, and then it progressively got bigger. I, we're at the point now to where there's so many state cook-offs every weekend that, you know, it, it's, it's hard to get 60 or 80 guys at one of those things like we were getting a couple of years ago. Now you're getting 35 or 40 guys at, at or teams, male or female, at these events, and, and that's kind of a big show. Um, occasionally you'll get these monstrous deals, like when you get down on the coast or something, everybody wants to party on the coast. But for the most part, 35 or 40 teams is, is what you're going to get anymore. And, and that's, a, that's a big cook-off these days. Yeah, it's, uh, it's good that you're still able to have cook-offs. We're, uh, we're not able to get to cook-offs just at the moment, but we're hoping to get there soon. So, mate, tell me about the, the World Champion Squirrel Cook-Off. How did that come about? That sounds really interesting. It started off because I told a big lie. Uh <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the truth man i had uh andrew zimmer from bizarre foods call and wanted me to host the ozark edition of bizarre foods and he listed a long list of animals he'd like to see done on the show it was bear and, and uh, sucker fish which is kind of a trash fish um rabbits uh what else did he want to see on there crow hunting which you know, it's kind of a trash bird. And then he said, does anybody in your circle know how to cook squirrel? And I said, oh, yeah, man, we throw the world champion squirrel cook off. And he said, when is it? I said, well, when are you coming? And he gave me a date. And I said, you won't believe it, but it's that same weekend. And uh, <laughs> I, I hit the phone and I was able to get 25 teams from four different states lined up in a week's time. and. Uh, we went out and killed a mess of squirrels and and had the first squirrel cook-off, and it aired in 120 countries. And the next year, uh, we got the front page of the Wall Street Journal. Um, after that, you know, every media company started hitting us up and wanted to showcase what we were doing. Um, the squirrel cook-off was kind of my way to uh, to show people that you could take the smallest animal and feed big big groups of community and a squirrel is, you know, cleaned out. It's going to weigh about a pound, a pound and a quarter. And 
at the end of the day, we're feeding 8,000 people a squirrel dish. So yeah, it's a, it's kind of a big party. Um, but you know, when we first started the traditional way of cooking squirrel would be like dumplings or maybe cooking it in a crock pot with some cream of mushroom soup, something really silly, you know, and boring. But we instantly brought in the squirrel taco, the squirrel pizza. Uh, you know, we threw, we threw it all together and, uh, we use every part of the squirrel from the head to the nutsack. <laughs> There's nothing on the squirrel that is, uh, cannot be cooked. And so over the years, we've brought in desserts like, you know, squirrel ice cream. Uh, we've had squirrel sushi. Um, we, you cannot make something up in your head that probably hasn't went across the judging table. And so I take a lot of pride in that, man. Uh, you know, I, here in, in the United States, squirrel is kind of one of these things that people would consider a, a poverty food or, you know, last resort to eat a tree rat. And uh, so I had to come up with good names for it. We call it limb chicken, tree bacon, uh, the tofu of the woods, right? Because it'll absorb any flavor. Um, I had to really pitch this animal. And so I started off with a 100% organic tree to table. Um, <laughs> I tell everybody, you know, it comes in a biodegradable package, right? That fur that's on the outside of it, you throw it in the woods, it'll go away pretty quickly. There's no styrofoam, there's no hormones, there's nothing in it but solid meat. And, uh, and it's all nut fed, you know, that's important. People like that kind of stuff. So, uh, it's a sustainable product that is amazing. So I'm sure you got a bunch of questions, Ben, on squirrels. Oh, mate, so many, my, my, my head's racing at the moment. So, okay. Uh, so, uh, are you catching wild squirrels every year or are these farm squirrels now at this stage where you've got crowds of 8,000 you got to feed? Well, there's no such thing as a farm squirrel, Ben. So oh, okay. the, I tell you what, if, if you were to Google Wilson squirrel dairy, it'd zoom you in right in my house. And, and I've got a big metal sign by the front of the house that says I have a squirrel dairy. Um, there's no such thing as a squirrel dairy, Ben, but I've got a sign that says that. And I get countless people call and ask if they can tour the dairy. And I tell them you got to milk the squirrels when they're climbing down the tree. And we just feel a little thimble. That's all we can get out of one squirrel is like a thimble of squirrel milk. But I tell them it's got a higher butter fat than like blue whale. Um, so, <laughs> so, uh, so to answer your question, circle back to what the question was. The question was, do we raise these squirrels or do we hunt them? You said trap. We go out and, and we shoot squirrels. And uh, they live in the trees, you know, and so we'll walk around. We'll take our kids. We'll take our dogs. We'll make our necks hurt from looking up in the trees all day. And, and we'll harvest these squirrels. And so that's the way it works. Um, Hundreds of people who have never went squirrel hunting have went squirrel hunting because of the squirrel cook-off. Because either you got to know a guy as ugly as I am, or you got to go out and take care of it yourself. <laughs> and how many squirrels do you need to feed 8,000 people? I'm guessing like uh, 8,000 squirrels. Pretty much all of them. <laughs> we, 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 we pretty much need all of the squirrels to feed all those people, man. A, a good answer would be, I don't know. It's probably going to take 800 to a thousand squirrels. Um, it, it's going to take a lot of squirrels to do it, but, but the, the rules of, of this competition is, is 80% of the protein inside your dish. 80% of the meat has to be squirrel. Squirrels an extremely lean meat. So I give you that 20% to add fat to it, you know, so you can use pork fat or sausage or bacon or, or combine it with beef. Um, we've had teams make squirrel and rattlesnake sausage 
You know, it's kind of a predator and prey type deal. So they'll grind wow. up rattles, throw and combine it. And a hundred percent of what you do in this competi competition has to be done on site. So if you're grinding meat, you're grinding it on site. If you're making a sauce or whatever, you're making it on on the actual competition day. We give the teams three and a half hours at a minimum. It's kind of a draw, right? So when you show up, we go through the rules of the competition. You draw a number. If you get one and two, that's the first two turn-ins. And then there's five minutes in between each one of those pairs of numbers that follow. So you may have four and a half hours. Uh, so you kind of got to pace yourself because squirrel will get rubbery pretty quick. And so if you rush into this deal and, and just get after it without pacing yourself, you're probably not going to win. Yeah, I don't doubt that at all. Now, was that uh, squirrel and rattlesnake sausage, is that the wildest entry that you've seen? Oh, absolutely not, Ben. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, we've... Uh, uh, the last world champion went on the, the Mexican food wagon, right, and made these squirrel stuffed poblano peppers and then made a squirrel enchilada, and then they made Spanish rice with squirrel balls in it. And uh, it was uh, it was what took the took the $1,000 award and the trophy. Um, it, it, you know, I, I don't know what that's telling you, but squirrel balls and rice is actually something that, you know, it should be more mainstream. Okay. All right. I've been to uh to a couple of Vietnamese restaurants where some of the the meatballs in the uh, noodle soup were a bit questionable. So I'm assuming that uh, that it would be much the same. Um, <laughs> so is there that there's obviously no um no markdowns on presentation for things like bullet holes, or well, <laughs> no. So actually, one of the scoring factors of the event is presentation. So. We supply each team with a regular turn-in box like you'd have at any KCBS, you know, a styrofoam box with no dividers. And they build up a, just a beautiful presentation of what they're turning in. So every entree has to be followed with a side dish. And that side dish should, you know, it should merge really well with your entree. And so presentation has been a big, big part of our event. And, uh, I tell you, one of the things that I was just thinking about, we had a team that deboned their squirrels. They, they took every bone out, and this was just a flat piece of flesh. And they took the femur bone of the squirrel, and they wrapped this meat around there and made this little tiny ham, okay? And they <laughs> secured this ham through through. And so they vacuumed it. They got the cure deep inside of this little bitty ham. They smoked it, and then they served it with some quail eggs, so these little bitty eggs. And uh, inside their turn-in box, they had a cross-section of a, of a chunk of wood inside there. And then uh, so you had ham and eggs, and then they had a little cocktail inside this thing that they had smoked. And they made a little mixer sucker using candied squirrel inside of a sucker. So, yeah, we've had uh, the bloody squirrel drink, right? It's a take on the Bloody Mary. And that's using squirrel broth inside of the tomato juice. And, uh, yeah, so it's a culinary event. Um, if I told you that we've had James Beard people cooking in the event, that's because we've had James Beard people cooking in this event. Um, we had a chef from Nobu come down and do squirrel sushi, which, you know, that's kind of a big deal. And, and uh, so our event has brought out housewives and hippies. It's brought out old people, young people, fine dining chefs and barbecue legends have all joined together to cook in the squirrel cook-off. So, it's a great way to get away from cooking three specific meats every Saturday. Got a project you'd like to work on with the SHC team? Shoot Ben an email on ben at smokinghotconfessions.com and let's have a conversation. So now as well as the, the, the World Champion Squirrel Cook-Off, you're also the founder of uh, 
of Steaks for Sheepdogs, which was what Mark Lambert first uh, first mentioned to me, um, t- uh, talking about you about. So give us an idea of, of what Steaks for Sheepdogs is. Well, uh, in July, five years ago, there was a, a bad guy who went down to Dallas, Texas, and he killed nine police officers in one night. Wow. And I walked live on the news like millions of other people were, and it, it upset me quite a bit. And so my wife told me, she said, I bet you're going to try to do something about this. And so the next day I went to our local police station and, and I talked to the police chief. And I told him that, man, I was appalled by what had happened on the news and, and I wanted to help heal people. And, and I'm a firm believer that food is one of the easiest ways to build relationships and heal. And so I told him I wanted to cook a ribeye dinner for every police officer that they had. And, and uh, so that Friday we gathered together and we did 150 ribeye dinners. Um, but that was just the start of it. Since that point, five years ago, we've cooked over 35,000 ribeye dinners across the country. Wow. And uh, yeah, so it's, it's an amazing thing. Man, we've had Johnny Joseph, we've had you name it in the SCA, the top people, the bottom people, it doesn't matter. We all get together. And then regular people, um, not competition cooks, backyard folks, right? So we get out and we make the same dinner at every event. It's a ribeye, choice or better. Uh, We do mashed potatoes and we do green beans with a roll and a dessert. And so I've worked with Townsend Spice and we come up with a three pack of seasoning. So our meal tastes the same everywhere we go. So we could cook from coast to coast. We could cook in Australia and you'd have the same meal that we'll cook in Oklahoma. Um, and so it's a, it's a slick way for us to get additional people across the country involved in it. We'll send them out everything it takes to do the meal and they throw these meals together. So we feed police, we feed firefighters, EMS. Um, we've been doing the nurses at the hospital, you know, who've been hammered. Uh, some of these events will do 800 or a thousand steak dinners and we can throw them together in two or three hours. Wow. That's phenomenal. I was, um, I was reading up on the, on the website there. It was for, uh, uh, Leos, Leos, and first responders. So, first responders, yep. I understand, police officers, paramedics, and all that. What's an Leo? Law enforcement officer, a Leo. Ah, okay, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so you, uh, it's almost like like drop shipping a a charity event. Almost, you just post everything out to people that want to put it on. Yeah, so we've worked hard um, at getting what we call like a, a, a district representative. And so we'll have them in the northern part of the country. We'll have them in the south and the east, all over the place. And when an incident takes place, well, they're our point guy. And so we've worked out a plan on what it takes to do it. I mean, it's real similar, similar to Operation Barbecue Relief, right? It's the same style deal. Um, we had to simplify it, come up with one dish that we were going to do. And, and here, I'll be honest with you, Ben, uh, a steak dinner, most of our law enforcement officers, most of our firefighters, they can't afford it. Um, their wages are real low. And uh, so whenever somebody is murdered or we're, we lose a firefighter in an incident or if it's a suicide or whatever it is, You know, we bring the families. It's not just the people with the badge. We bring the wives. We bring the kids in. And it's the only time they get to sit around and have this world champion steak dinner. I mean, matter of fact, most of your listeners have never ate a world champion steak dinner. They made a real good one, but they haven't had one cooked by by the world champions. And that's what Steaks for Sheepdogs brings. Um, you know, there's times we'll have multiple world champions standing around the flame and cooking these dinner for these people. So it's real cool because, you know, we've been at events to where there's, uh, you know, a, a, a son of a police officer 
lost his father and we'll take him out, bring him around the fire. Uh, Lambert and Eric Hodson from Boar's Night Out, you know, took this nine-year-old boy whose dad was killed the weekend before and, and taught him how to, how to cook a world-class steak. And, uh, those are things that these kids will never forget. And we bring people closer to the flame and that's kind of the goal. And it sounds like just incredible work that you're doing there. So that's, that's, you know, my, my, my hat is off to you. Cause that's, that's some, just some great stuff. So what was the, um, what was the biggest single event that you've ever done with, uh, with Stakes for Sheepdogs? Oh man, we, uh, a thousand, a thousand is probably as big as it gets. Um, it's just hard. We volunteered to go up to New York city, but I tell you the, the complete circle on this would be to get back down to Dallas and do it for those people. And, um, you know, that's a big number. I don't even think you could imagine how big it is, but it's about 20,000 dinners if we had to go to Dallas. And so if there was any place in the world that you could do a 20,000 steak dinner, it's going to be in Texas because that's what people do day in and day out, you know, is cook steaks. And so at some point we're going to find our way to Dallas and we're going to, we're going to do 20,000 steaks. Um, when someone asks how many steaks can we do, it's, it's always, we'll do as many as you want to put, you know, as many people can sit there. That's how many steak dinners we'll, we'll cook for people. Yeah. Well, it's only a couple of minutes per steak, isn't it? It's not like you've got to tell people to wait another eight hours for another brisket to come on. So yeah, I can, I, I can see the appeal of doing it with steak. Yeah. And so, you know, when we first started off, I had a big grill called the meat coffin. It'd do 150 ribeyes at a time. Um, we'd put four or five guys on the meat coffin and we'd start slinging meat. But over the last couple of years, I found out it's, it's a lot more communal if we're bringing out the hasty bakes and, and the PK grills and the Weber's and everybody gets to stand around their own fire. Um, the steaks are all going to taste the same because we prep them all the same. And one thing that we do at this event is say we have 500 steaks to do. We'll go through and we'll sort through the 500 steaks and we'll pick out the very best one. And then we'll have someone prep it SEA style, right? So they're going to tie the steak, the whole nine yards. And we cook that steak for the fallen. So we'll prop that steak up. We'll, we'll dress up the plate real nice. We lay our flag down. We lean up a, a chair on the table and we have a moment of silence around that steak. And that's the only steak that will not be eaten during the event. So yeah, real cool deal. Yeah, right. And what happens to that steak after the event? Well, Ben, we throw it in the trash. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, I wish I wish we had something to do with it, man. But, you know, it served its purpose for those two or three hours when it sat there on the table. Um, typically, the family will come by. The loved ones will come by. It's such a classy deal that uh, it does everything that it was supposed to do. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I was just curious because I know that you know police officers and uh, and and firemen, for example, they they often work with dogs. I thought maybe that the steak, once it was remembered for the fallen, might have been given to the fallen's canine partner or something. Or, yeah, we're we're not there. We're not there yet. <laughs> well, maybe later. <laughs> so, what's been the what, what's been the the biggest challenge for you for, for setting this whole thing up? Uh, you know what? It's easy. Um, I, I tell you, anybody can do anything you put your mind to. I, I can guarantee you there's more people out there who will follow you. We just need more people to open the doors, right? And so, you know, I, I'm not going to take any of the glory of Stakes for Sheepdogs. It's the volunteers who gather up to show up on that day and actually put the put the food on the table. I'm just the guy who initiates it and, and opens the door for people to follow me. And I've been blessed by having people follow me into all kinds of stuff, whether it's cooking squirrels or if it's uh, cooking ribeyes. Um, it, it's important that I can promise you there's a need in every part of this globe to reach out and build community. Um, you know, we've seen it over the last 18 months, right? How people are hunkered down. 
that's plenty of time for people to dream up how they're going to make this world a better place. And uh, if we all did our small part, that'd make a big, big deal. And uh, so, you know, just go out there and think about how you could help your neighbor, how you could help your community. And, and that's what we do. I, I have no plans on solving police violence. I don't have any plans on solving hatred towards cops or any of that stuff. I just think that if I could bring people together and see that we're all human, that maybe there's a chance I could change a person or a few people. Um, it's impossible to make everybody like anything. You know what I mean? So it's just, let's just do our part at changing one and see how the dominoes fall. Yeah. It's got to start somewhere, doesn't it? So you just, Pick pick one thing and work on that, and then uh, and and it'll grow from there. So what's uh what what future plans do you have for for stakes for sheepdogs? Man, just uh carry on the need wherever it takes place. You know, um, we're a big country. We have three hundred twenty million people. There's not a night goes by in the United States where there isn't a need for what we do. Uh, we lose police officers at the rate of over a hundred a year who are murdered. Um, we lose firefighters weekly to suicide or, or loss of life during an event. These medical doctors and, and, and nurses, you know, they're struggling right now. They're struggling all across the globe. And, and so they need to be fed too. And, and I'm telling you, there is so much horrible barbecue out there and so much horrible steaks that are gray and ugly and leathery that whenever you cook somebody something proper, it starts healing them real quick because they can tell that there's a chance that there's better food. And that's what we provide to people is just a great, great dinner. You're listening to the internationally awarded Smoking Hot Confessions podcast with massive barbecue nerd, Ben Arnott. Okay, Joe, so now we're into the third segment of our show, and this is the part where our guest gets to share some wisdom, share some thoughts uh, with our listeners and our viewers. Now, one of the things that we were talking about off air that you are really passionate about that you wanted to share some, uh, share some knowledge on was wild game, uh, fish, feathers, and 100% organic meat. So I'm going to basically throw it over to you now. And I'll, uh, I'll I'll ask some questions along the way, but uh, let's uh, let's uh, share some wisdom. Yeah, so you know, here's how I look at wild game. I look at wild game as like if you if you were to harvest a wild boar, that's actually what pork is supposed to taste like. Um, pigs taste like pig, not like what you buy at the grocery store that has no fat on it. It's super lean. The word gaminess is actually all animals taste gamey if they're fed a natural diet. If they're fed the diet that, that agriculture puts through them and you speed through the process, well, then you get this real bland taste of meat. So over the years, we've cooked everything. Man, it's kind of a dream of mine to get a hold of one of these bin chickens that you guys have over there. Uh, <laughs> And see and see what I can do with benches. I hear that you guys are appalled by them. I'd like to jerk the feathers off one of those deals and turn it into something real sexy. Um, but so one of the things with wild game meat is people have this idea that this this meat isn't healthy, that it might have disease or parasites or or something in there. So they tend to overcook it. And, and the truth is, is most game meat should be at that rare to medium rare level. Um, it, it, it's like deer here in the U.S. So many people will just wrap bacon and throw a jalapeno on something that they, they think tastes nasty. Um, I hate that idea. You know, if you're not that good of a cook where you just try to wrap bacon and a jalapeno on it and say how good it tastes, like I could see a lot of people taking your bin chicken and wrapping jalapeno and bacon on there and saying it was really good. I doubt it. It tasted like soggy, stretchy bacon with a burnt jalapeno on on something. Um, that's that's kind of the cop out. So over the years, man, we take these animals that everybody thinks are uh, 
our trash and we prepare them in, in magnificent ways. You know, I go to Alaska every year and, and we harvest king salmon and halibut and, and all of that, but we'll catch numerous fish that the guides will tell us are trash. And those are the ones that we eat for dinner that night. Uh, the other, <laughs> the <best. laughs> and uh, so, you know, like in, in, in Alaska, codfish is a trash fish, which here in the U S if we see cod on the menu, we'll buy it. Um, it's, it's good. And so to teach these guys how to take these animals that they find undesirable and cook them the proper way and, you know, dress them up a bit. It's, it's something I'm really, really, really passionate about. Yeah. It's, it's funny that you talk about things like, uh, like codfish. When I was traveling through Arkansas, we would stop at a couple of different roadside diners and stuff like that. And we frequently saw catfish on the menu and catfish here in Australia like if you catch a catfish, you just kill it and leave it on the bank. You don't even bother throwing it back in the river because they're considered a pest. So uh, to, to see them on the menu, uh, like ev- uh, everywhere through Arkansas, there was was quite interesting. So well, you you talk about catfish. It's kind of catfish is from the same roots as barbecue. Um, barbecue was cooking these tough, undesirable pieces of meat that they would let you have, right? Um, you know, barbecue originated through slavery and, and the, the black folks of Southern United States. And so they would be given the ribs or they would be given all of the tough cuts of meat. And these people learned how to go low and slow and add sugars and add flavor to it, to make it desirable. So catfish is the same exact deal. Catfish is a Southern delicacy. Um, and why is because it was an undesirable fish where there was millions of them and rich people didn't want to eat them. And so we learned how to fillet them properly, take off the red meat. Right. And then you get just a white piece of flesh that you could batter and fry. Or we have a chef here in town who actually makes uh, catfish pastrami. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of the important thing here, here in my country, you know, last year we had for the first time in my life, we had shortages of things. And, you know, I get a kick out of seeing Australians when they come to, to Fort Worth and they go to the grocery store and see the abundance of stupidity that we have at our stores. And, and, uh, you know, we'll have 40 kinds of pickles because somebody won't eat a pickle unless it's cut like a spear or they only want a pickle cut like a chip. Um, we're really, really spoiled. And whenever, uh, this thing happened across the globe and things started disappearing from our shelves, people got scared because the reason why they were scared is they had no ability to do it themselves. Right. They had no idea how to pickle something. Um, our butchers were backed up 18 months. So even if you had livestock, you couldn't get your livestock slaughtered and, and packaged. Um, and most of the people raising livestock have no idea how to, how to cut it. You know, they know how to feed it. They don't know how to do the end game. And so earlier this year, I, I, started a class and we took a lamb and we showed people how to process the lamb and cut it into retail cuts and showed them how to make sausage and, and cure the lamb and do the whole nine yards. Cause if you can do it on that lamb, you could pretty much do it on anything. So the one animal that's always been available in the United States has been the squirrel. There was a time that we were down to less than a hundred deer in Arkansas. Currently, we have about 2 million deer, but whenever the depression hit, everybody went out and killed all the deer. That's all they had to eat. And when they killed all the deer, they were just down to squirrel and uh, learned how to cook it. And so that goes back to your catfish. Um, If there's no fancy fish to catch and eat, you got to eat something. And so that's that's the cool deal about doing what you do and doing what I do. We learn how to cook undesirable pieces of flesh like a lamb neck right um 
people in the U S have no value in a lamb neck. And after watching the guys in Australia cook this beautiful lamb neck, it's my favorite piece of the lamb. And I have fed tons and tons of people lamb neck and they truth. I'm going to say 90% of Americans hate lamb. You know, it's this horrible, nasty thing. And they think the only thing that comes from a lamb is a lamb chop. They have no idea of any other cut of the lamb. And so during this class, we cooked the shanks. We, uh, we ground some lamb. We did the neck. I actually cooked the lamb tongue, which was just a little bitty thing. I can't feed. And, uh, so yeah, it's, it's a cool deal. So that's what wild game means to me. It means you always have a chance to eat. Uh, when you can't buy it at the store, there's something out there, whether it be that catfish or, or be the squirrel, there's something you can put on the table and feed your family and make it through whatever bad time they throw at us. Yeah. It's interesting. Uh, what you are just saying about the, the deer in the forest and in, and in hard times, people going out to the forest, I'd, I grew up on a farm and so we used to process our own cows and goats and sheep and things there as well. And uh, when all the lockdowns and things first started happening here about 18 months ago, again, over here, everybody got real, really scared. And uh, I went out to the, to the camping in the army disposal store and I bought all these, uh, you know, water purifying tablets and hunting slingshots and all that sort of stuff. And my wife's like, what are you going to do with that? And I said, I'm going to do what I did when I was a kid. <laughs> like, yeah. if, like if we have to bug out of here. And you know we're going to be eating possums and birds, so that's what's happening. So yeah, yeah. and that's and that's how I try to teach my family and I teach my friends. You know, there's plenty of stuff to forage. Um, the people before us did it, and we just got lazy. Um, if it's not in a package, and you can't put it in the microwave, or you know, I, I think that's like part of the glory of barbecue is you build enough patience to sit and wait eight or 10 hours to eat something. There's nothing left in society that takes eight or 10 hours, right? You get completely upset if it takes an hour to do anything, um, whether it's the guy changing your oil or how long you wait at the doctor or whatever it is, you're upset about it. So barbecue, especially low and slow barbecue, teaches us patience. And that's very human to have patience, right? And as a society, we've plumb lost it. Uh, we get mad at stupid, stupid things. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, that's, that's glory to barbecue, man. I, I think that that's part of the brotherhood is you're around other people that have patience. And that's a good thing. Yeah, you're not wrong about us losing all our different skills and things, and uh, and and that knowledge and that understanding of where our food comes from. I, um, as I said, I grew up on a farm, and I uh, I was making a joke one day with my son. I was saying, look, if that if that cat pees on the carpet again, then that cat's going on the barbecue. And my son, who was uh, he was eating his dinner at the time, holding a lamb chop in his hand, waved it in my face and said, "Daddy, we don't hurt animals." Um, 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 um. And I just. You know, I those lambs and all the animals, they live a happy life. They just have one bad day. That's true. Right? <laughs> so so that's how I look at it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the other thing that, uh, that you're really passionate about is 100% organic meat. Why is that? Well, because I, I tell you what, here in the States, it takes five weeks to raise a chicken, right? from the time it hatched out of an egg to the time it's wrapped in cellophane and put at the grocery store, that's a five week process. Um, that's not very natural. Uh, there, there's, there's not animals out in the woods that in five weeks are mature enough for us to harvest. And so it's that long process, man, of eating bugs and nuts and berries that adds all that flavor to the food. And, and there's nothing in wild game meat that's, uh, that's bad for you. It's, it's clean protein. And it's the stuff that people pay extra for, for the package at the grocery that says grass fed. I've got news for people. All cows eat grass, right? <laughs> and uh, if they don't, they're never going to get big. 
So all cows eat grass, but it's the, the word organic by the USDA terms is so far fetched. It doesn't mean that this thing has never had any artificial foods fed to it. Um, the, the, the word free range means that maybe that chicken could see outside and step two foot outside of a, of a barn. It doesn't mean that this chicken's just roaming free. There's a door at the end of the barn that if a chicken wanted to, it could walk out there, but not whenever you throw all the food right in front of its face. It has no reason to go outside. And so it's a gimmick. It's, it's, a, it's a way for them to get more money out of every pound of meat, and, and it's, a, it's just a lie. Um, a true, true organic meat is the stuff that you would go out and see in a natural area. Um, a place where nature's doing what nature has done long before we got here. And uh, that's what we started off eating. And there's a pretty good chance if you eat it every day that you'll live longer and be healthier. Um, it's, it's just, it's a circle of life, man. And, and I like being part of it. You're not wrong there, man. You're not wrong at all. All right, look, that's probably a good point for us to start to wrap this episode up. So I'm going to throw the studio over to you now. You can give some thanks, give some praise, give some shout-outs to people that have helped you out along the way and tell everybody where they can track down the uh, the world champion squirrel cook-off and steaks for sheepdogs online. So, uh, you know, I've, I'd like to thank anybody I ever met. <laughs> you know, everybody's built me to the point that I'm at today and, and – you know, I feel blessed that I get to hang out with, with some of the legends of barbecue and, and, you know, Hey, Dan Greenwood down there in, in, in Australia, that old tree bark, solid stuff. I, I wish that we could, we could get more of it here in the U S. Um, Dane, I like old Dane down there. That fellow with the red beard. Uh, <laughs> I like watching him cook stuff, man. I'd love to come down to Australia sometime and hang out and cook with y'all. But truthfully, hey, all it takes is some fuel, a lighter, and some flesh, and you've got barbecue. That's it. Um, I think as, as a general rule, we overthink this and make it more complicated than it really is. There's nothing wrong with salt and pepper. Um, <laughs> there's just not. I have three seasonings that I sell commercially. I've got the, the Wilson Shire and my products are called horsing around um they're great but you don't need them you can do stuff with salt and pepper and uh i just think that if we spend more time building bigger tables and smaller fences we're all going to be happy yes yeah, there's some uh there's some beautiful ideas there isn't it uh particularly the, the the bigger table and smaller fence that's a personal philosophy of, of of mine as well now just quickly make sure that you do tell everybody where they can track you down on the internet man just look me up joe wilson on facebook or you could go uh on the world wide web there and and look up stakes the number 4 sheepdogs and you can see what we're doing on that and and all you got to do is a quick google search and you'll find all there is to know about the squirrel cook off I'll tell you, I'm going to do something really stupid come April, uh, Saturday before Easter. I'm going to do the first rabbit cook-off, and we're going to be cooking the Easter bunny and doing the rabbit versus the hare race and doing Easter egg hunt. Look for me on CNN and look for my house being burnt down by PETA. I'm sure you'll see that in April. <laughs> Sounds like a good time, man. Best of luck with it, and thank you very much for coming on the show. Thank you, Ben. All righty, family, there you have it. That was Joe Wilson from the World Champion Squirrel Cook-Off Steaks for Sheepdogs. He's a character. He's an absolute uh, class act of a man, and he's doing some great stuff to help uh, to help the people that help us, particularly the, the LEOs, the law enforcement officers, and the other first responders as well. So if you do have a chance, get out there, do support them. It's a great concept, great idea, and he's doing some really important work there as well. How much fun does that squirrel cook-off sound? I mean, seriously, that sounds wild. I really hope I can get over there one time. And uh, as I was saying to uh, to Joe there, my, my wife's family is from Arkansas, so there's a good chance I'll be over there at some point in the near future. i just got to make sure those dates line up. That would be pretty cool. All right. Now, before I let you go, just got to remind you of the announcements from the, from the top of the show. We've got our T-shirts, hoodies, caps, 
beanies, all that sort of stuff available for you just in time for Christmas. We've got our free ebook available for you, The Beginner's Guide to Real Barbecue. That's over on the website as well. We've got the Smoking Hot Confessions Barbecue community on Facebook. It's all about barbecue. We leave all the other guff at the door. And it's just, it's family friendly and it's barbecue focused. And the last thing, of course, is if you're catching this on the socials later on, do the thing for us. Give us the thumbs up, the likes, the shares, the comments, all that sort of stuff. If you've enjoyed the show, leave us a comment. Tell us what was your favorite part of the show. Things like that help drive the algorithm and help us spread our love of barbecue further and wider through the world. Now, that is all the time we have for today. So, until next time, take care of each other and keep on queuing. Thanks for listening to the Smoking Hot Confessions podcast. Head on over to smokinghotconfessions.com for recipes, tips, and Ben's own confessions. <laughs>